Thank you for joining today's webinar, Composting with Worms on a Mid to Large Scale, What, Why, How, and Who. I'm Brenda Platt, the Director of the Institute for Local Self-Reliance's Composting for Community Initiative. This webinar is one in a series that we offer to advance composting and share working models and tips for replication. We are particularly interested in supporting a distributed, distributed and diverse infrastructure for composting and food waste reduction and recovery. Our last webinar featured bike powered food scrap collection with a spotlight on equipment, so check that out. Today we will be talking about vermicomposting or composting with worms. And I can think of no better person than Rhonda Sherman with North Carolina State University to address how to compost with worms on a mid to large scale. Her latest book is shown here, The Worm Farmer's Handbook, which is a guide to mid and large scale vermicomposting for farms, businesses, municipalities, schools, and institutions. Given the um, importance of healthy soils to healthy food, and healthy communities, and particularly now increasingly recognized carbon sequestration, her handbook couldn't be more timely. So today, Rhonda's gonna cover the many, many benefits of vermicompost, some basics, who can compost from schools and farms to municipalities and businesses, how to plan for success and what pitfalls to avoid. And then she's gonna end with um, uh, showing us uh, some vermicomposting operations around the world and a wide range of setups, setups and systems. She's going to talk for about 50 or so minutes, and we're going to try to leave 30 minutes for Q&A, so I hope you can all stay on to uh, get all your questions answered. Um, before I introduce Rhonda even more fully, let me just say a few words about the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. We're a national organization and we support local economies, which means we don't accept national advertising. So please consider making a donation to ILSR at ILSR.org slash donate. Not only does your support underwrite this webinar, but it also helps us produce the resources and research we make available for free on our website. Any amount is welcome and sincerely appreciate it. That's ILSR.org slash donate. Um, now let me just say a few words on uh, more on Rhonda. She's an extension specialist with the Department of Horticultural Science at North Carolina State University, as I already indicated. That's in Raleigh, North Carolina. She's a leading authority on vermicomposting and organized the world's, organizes the world's only annual conference on large-scale commercial vermicomposting. She had her 19th conference last November. She's also the founder and director of a two-acre compost learn, learning lab as part of NC State University. And that features 26 different types of composting and vermicomposting bins, as well as areas for hands-on training activities. She's taught composting and vermicomposting in Guyana, the Dominican Republic, Argentina, Chile, and throughout the US. And she has offered over 65 publications on vermicomposting, composting, recycling, and waste reduction. Um, so we are really pleased to have her today. Uh, as we're, uh, before we hand the reins over to Rhonda, we're gonna do um, three polling questions just to get a sense of who's on the line today. So uh, my colleague, Virginia, thank you, Virginia, is helping with tech today. We'll bring up the uh, first polling question. So select one or more of the following. Do you represent government, nonprofit, private business? Are you a community scale composter or hauler? Do you fall into an other category? We usually like to wait till we have about 80% of the votes in. Still votes coming in. All right, let's see the results. Ooh, most of have third in the other category, but one fifth government, one fifth private business. Okay, next uh, poll is um, question: Where are you? Are you in the East Coast, US, West Coast, Southwest, Midwest, or are you outside the US? Okay, let's show the results. Looks like the East Coast is winning. 
Southwest, outside US, have some international participants, great. And then the uh, two more questions. Are you, give us an idea if you're currently vermicomposted, interested in starting to vermicompost, do you want to support vermicomposting? Like you're not actually gonna do it, but you're at your local government, you wanna see more of this decentralized diverse composting. So you might wanna fund it or support it in some other way, or you fall into another category. Oh, all right, let's show the results. Well, I'm surprised by this one. Almost two thirds of you are already doing it, but a quarter interest in starting. Okay, Rhonda, you have some seasoned vermicomposters on the line. Um, all right, last question. For those vermicomposting or interest in starting, so only those two categories, what best represents your location? Are you a farm? Are you another business, school, municipality, other? Okay. Votes are still coming in. All right, let's see the results. There's a big mix here. Most are in the other category. All right, two fifths other, other, but we have one fifth farmers, 10% schools, 15% cities. Okay, interesting. All right, we will, before we do Q&A, we'll have a few more polling questions at the end, but without further ado, we're gonna uh, hand it over to Rhonda to start. So let's just um, let her control the screen and advance her own slides. Bear with us as we do this. Okay, Rhonda, say a few things. Are you muted? There hey you there. Are. It's okay. Great to be here. <laughs> you it sound good. While, but I guess you can hear me. Yes, you sound great. And you can see the screen, right? You got it. Yes. Wonderful. Let's get started. I'm very pleased that so many of you have joined us today from all over the United States and other parts of the world. Um, so this is mid to large scale vermicomposting, as we said, and um, that means I won't be covering, how, um, you know, uh, beginning vermicomposting, although I do have a slide uh, with a link to one of my publications about that. So um, take note of my uh, web address there. If you go to that web address, you will find lots of information I've written about small scale and large scale vermicomposting and small scale and large scale composting. Okay, so you'll find lots of information there. So um, we're here because I wrote the Worm Farmer's Handbook. I was thinking we should have done a poll. How many people have already read it? <laughs> but anyway, um, so in writing this, I, you know, there just really wasn't anything out there. There are some books on small scale vermicomposting, but not on mid to large scale. And so this is for people who, you know, if, like you have a farm and you have livestock manure or crop residues, and you would like to turn them into a beneficial soil amendment. So you can do that through vermicomposting or say you're at, um, a restaurant or a grocery store or um, a school. A school, you know, many schools are doing vermicomposting. They'll they'll have like a small worm bin in their classroom. But um, this book addresses how you can do uh, school wide vermicomposting, and um, and then many institutions are doing it. I do have a slide about all this later, but my book is filled with photographs of operations all over the world, actually. So I profiled at least 25 different um, vermicomposting operations, um, including at schools and farms. So you'll be able to see all that. Um, so these are the some of the topics that I cover in the Worm Farmer's Handbook. Um, they'll help you choose what kind of production system works for you. You know, we're 
we're all in different situations and we have different climates and climate is definitely very important. So um, later on, I will be showing you pictures of different types of vermicomposting systems. Uh, regulatory issues is very important because, um, so anybody who's wanting to do this on a larger scale, so if you wanna do it at a community garden or you wanna start a vermicomposting business or do it on site at a hospital or a restaurant or wherever, um, you really do need to check into um, state and local regulations to see if it's okay to do that. And if you do plan to have a business and sell the vermicompost, then I have a whole section that um, goes into detail about developing business and marketing plans. Um, I also talk about finding and managing feedstocks. That's what you're gonna feed the worms. And then pre-composting, why you would wanna do it and how to do it. And then um, once you get your worm bag going, how to monitor it to make sure that everything's going well and the worms are healthy. Um, and then how to harvest, screen, test, package, and store vermicompost. And you'll see that I actually said vermicast. I decided to use the term vermicast throughout the book because um, some, place, some businesses will call it castings and others will call it vermicompost. And so I kind of combined it to call it vermicast. And then I talk about markets for earthworms and vermicast. Um, how it benefits soils and plants, um, how to avoid common pitfalls to have a successful operation. And then again, like I said, in the last chapter, I really go into detail about different vermicomposting or op operations all over the world. So vermicomposting, to put it simply, you, um, Microorganisms and earthworms are working together to process food scraps, uh, some kind of feedstock. So I just happened to show a picture of food scraps, but you know it could be cow manure or something else. Um, and then they process it and turn it into a beneficial soil amendment. So we'll be talking more about that. Um, first of all, <laughs> there's people often um, interchange the terms vermicompost and compost. So I receive emails from all over the world and it gets confusing for me because, you know, they may have vermicompost in their subject line and then in the email, they might keep saying compost. And, you know, so I'm scratching my head going, which are you talking about? Vermicompost and compost are very different processes. So be very careful with the language so that people understand what you're talking about. Um, so I listed some of the differences here. Vermicompost is pa it's passed through worms. So worms have consumed it It's and stable vermicompost has come out the other end. And so whereas with composting, we call it thermophilic composting, and it's just use microorganisms. The activity of microorganisms are breaking down and consuming the organic feedstocks and converting it to compost. So you see the difference that, you know, there are um, microorganisms involved with vermicomposting too, but then the feedstock actually passes through the worms and comes out the other end. So big difference there. Um, and we often refer to vermicomposting as cold composting because as many of you might know, with composting, uh, you want it to reach, you want your compost pile to reach a certain temperature. You want it to be like above 131, um, right around 140 or a maximum of 150, you know, so you want your compost pile to heat up but the vermicompost, you want it to stay at a pretty stable temperature. And we'll talk about that temperature zone in a few minutes. But um, because it stays at this, you know, at a certain temperature, 
you get a wider variety and greater numbers of microorganisms. So it is a different microbe population involved in the two processes. And then if you're gonna sell compost, it will sell for about up to $35 per cubic yard. Whereas vermicompost will sell for $200 to $1,800 per cubic yard. Very valuable commodity. So these are some of the many benefits of vermicompost. Um, you'll notice that some of them are similar to compost, but um, again, vermicompost is a different process and it does have uh, different qualities from compost. So very fine particulate structure. Huh, I wonder why that is. It's passed through worms. <laughs> so very tiny worms have consumed the feedstocks. They're coming out the other end. They're fully stabilized. You could just use them right away. Um, so, so you could, as long as you know that it's actual worm castings and not the feedstocks. Um, the pH is gonna be near neutral. It has a high water holding capacity, teeming with microorganisms like I already mentioned. And then it, it contains nutrients that are in a form that can readily be taken up by plants. And then um, the real crowning achievement of vermicompost is that it has humic acids and plant growth hormones that have a really profound effect. So um, here's just a quick list of the effects that vermicompost has on plant growth and disease and pest suppression. So you'll find by adding vermicompost to soil, you'll get increased rates of germination, growth, flowering, and crop yields. So the seeds will germinate more quickly, the plants will, will um, emerge and, and grow bigger and stronger, and whatever that, um, that, flower produ that plant produces, whether it be flowers or fruit or vegetables, you'll have more of them. Um, the root development is, is much greater if you've added vermicompost and it tolerates stress a lot better. So it, there's decreased shock from transplanting plants. Um, there's reported plant vitality and fl flavor profile is enhanced. And also there are many, many studies many scientific studies that show decreased attacks by plant pathogens, parasitic nematodes, and insect pests. And so while I was writing the book, I went to Google Scholar and I just typed in vermicompost effects on plants. And within seconds, almost 30,000 scientific article references came up. And it was just, you know, just those three words. So imagine if you played around for a while and, um, you know, used different terminology. There, there are just thousands and thousands of scientific articles from all over the world where scientists are studying the effects of vermicompost on plants. So check that out. Um, so speaking of, let's look at this. So this was several years ago that myself and a couple of colleagues over about a year and a half we planted turnips in the field actually three different fields three different seasons um and we were actually it, it was a water quality study so we weren't uh, we weren't looking at the effect of vermicompost on plant growth but we couldn't help notice some differences so we finally took a quick picture and the, and, and so with this trial, we had um, randomized plots. All of the plots had equal amounts of nitrogen, okay? So we know nitrogen has a really big impact on um, plant growth. It's very much needed for plants. So we made sure that every plant grown had the same amount of nitrogen. And you may be scratching your head looking at this picture going, Oh, surely the, the two other turnips had more nitrogen, but they did not. They had the exact same amount of nitrogen as the one on the left. So what's the big difference? It's those plant growth hormones and humic acids. 
and the microorganisms in the vermicompost. So, so in our randomized plots, we had, we, um, some of the plots had zero vermicompost and some of the plots, we actually removed all of the soil from the plot six inches deep. And we, out of all that soil we took out of the plot, we removed 10% of it by volume and we um, added 10% vermicompost and mixed it thoroughly and put it back in the plot. And then for the other plots, we did 20% by volume vermicompost. And so these are the results. So the turnip you're seeing on the left had zero vermicompost. It's a regular size turnip. Take a look at that um, root, little spin, one spindly root there. And then the, the one next to it, the turnip in the middle, it had 10% by volume vermicompost added to the soil. And so look at that root system compared to the other one. And look at the greens. If you're in the turnip green business, you have just hit the jackpot. And then next to it is 20% by um, volume vermicompost. Look at that, I mean, just giant turnip. So, um, and you may be wondering, well, you know, my goodness, if you had added 100% vermicompost, would it just be this, you know, giganto <laughs> vegetable? But the thing is that vermicompost, um, a little bit goes a really long way. And by adding more um, can actually, add, um, it can be too much for the plant. And, and you can end up looking like the, um, turn up on the left. So you could add up to 40% by volume vermicompost if you wanted to, but once you get 50 or higher percentage, then um, you know, you're just wasting the vermicompost actually. And really, I mean, look at these two, look at the 10% and 20%, that's really all you need. So, so where is vermicomposting taking place? So I mentioned some of these and they were definitely on the cover of my um, book, but um, so farms and households, prisons are doing vermicomposting, hospitals, community gardens, restaurants, parks, wastewater treatment plants, universities and colleges, office buildings, schools, and daycare. And I'm just so excited that nowadays it seems like so many schools have their own gardens and having a compost bin and a worm bin is just a great addition to that. Um, military bases are doing vermicomposting. Entrepreneurs are, you know, for any of you who perked up when you saw the $200 to $1,800 for vermicompost, um, you might be seeing dollar signs and more and more people are, um, I mean, and, and it's not only the motivation for the money, but wanting to take waste products and turn them into something beneficial that can have such a profound effect on soil and plants. That's why so many entrepreneurs are getting into this. Um, food banks, vermicompost, some paper mills, um, I added sports stadium there because I visited the Seattle Kingdom back in 1995 and they had worm bins um, because they were serving salads um, during their games there. And so um, that's been done. And then grocery stores too. So, um, so if I, so we saw that almost two thirds of you are vermicomposting already and you might, and so um, you may want to improve the technique of the small worm bin because for, for many people, they, they do start a worm bin and then they don't quite understand how to do it correctly and then the worms die. And so you can see the link at the bottom of this that shows the, um, the link to my publication called Worms Can Recycle Your Garbage. It's only like four and a half pages long. I keep it short and concise. So it tells you how to set up a worm bin and be successful about it. And I recommend for anybody who, if you have not vermicomposted and you're thinking about doing a really, a much larger scale vermicomposting um, project, 
do not just go out and buy 10 pounds of worms or more because that may end up being wasted money because um, you really need to learn how to take care of worms before you endeavor to do a larger operation. So you want to um, just start small with one pound of worms and be successful with them and then start scaling up, okay? And so you want to use the correct earthworm species, which um, I emphasize this throughout the book. Isenia fetida is basically the, the best vermicomposting worm um, that even people in other countries throughout the world, so many of them use Isenia fetida. It just adapts much more easily to vermicomposting and you'll be very successful with them. They're less temperamental um, and tolerate a wider range of environmental conditions than many other earthworms. So make sure you get the right earthworm species and you wanna buy it from a worm grower. And so to buy it from a worm grower, um, you could ask your local cooperative extension office if they know somebody who's selling worms. Sometimes people who are raising rabbits will also, they'll use earthworms to process the rabbit manure. And so they might have worms to sell. Um, there are worm farmers all over the place, but um, you know, just because like if you Google um, worms, don't go for the first one that comes up, okay? <laughs> I mean, and I, I'm, I'm just saying that look around because the prices vary and um, so you wanna get a good price and you want a good reputation from, um, so check that out too, because you don't always, you know, sometimes um, it depends on the grower. You might not get the best um, worms to be successful, so. Um, Isenia fetida, it has many common names. Um, the one that's most used is probably red wiggler. But um, anyway, that's what you're looking for, Isenia fetida. So what they need is um, they operate best at a temperature between 60 and 80 degrees, okay? So um, that doesn't mean, I mean, Many of us are sitting here shivering throughout the country. And so that does not necessarily mean that you can't do it if it's below 60 degrees. Um, my poor worms are in my worm barn today at the compost learning lab. And um, it got down to like 17 degrees last night. So I'm sure they weren't happy about that, but I think with the right earthworm husbandry skills, you can keep them alive. And so I talk about that in the book, how to deal with temperature swings. But if you're gonna get into this commercially and you're depending on um, you know, this uh, steady income from vermicomposting, then you're going to want to keep it in that range, okay? But lots of people do it outdoors and you know, they, you can um, keep the worms comfortable outside of that range. But the worms do need moisture. They breathe through their skin. And so they need 80% moisture in the zone of the worm bin where they live. And they tend to live in the top four inches of the worm bin. So in that area, you're gonna want your bin to be about 80% moisture. And we'll talk more about that. Um, hey, Rhonda, yes. this is Brenda. Sorry to interrupt, but you were breaking up a little bit for me. Oh. I don't know for others. Can you just repeat your last sentence? Sure. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. So moisture um, needs to be 80% in the top four inches of the worm bin. So um, they need moisture to breathe through their skin. So moisture is very important. Um, next, we'll talk about pH and the... You're aiming for about neutral pH um, in the worm bin. Isenia fetida will tolerate a wider range of pH, but they do best if it's around neutral. And of course, since they are living beings, they do need oxygen, but 
don't you don't have to be so concerned about oxygen that you're getting a lot of um, evaporation and losing your moisture. So I really go into that in the book as well. And then keep in mind that the um, that Isenia fetida is sensitive to ammonia and salts. And so um, ammonia, that would be chicken manure. So do not try to feed straight chicken manure to worms because it's just too high in ammonia. And then um, for salts, if you had super salty institutional food or something, that could be an issue with the worms. So you just keep that in mind as well. So what will the worms eat? Um, they love livestock manure. So, you know, we're talking from cows and pigs and um, goats, sheep, llamas, alpacas, rabbits, um, all sorts of manures. Um, food residuals, spoiled grain, yard debris, cardboard, scrap paper, agricultural crop residues, coffee grounds, brewery waste, um, depending on, okay, you, you really, I always add, um, as far as brewery waste goes, if that's high in ammonia, um, that can be a problem. So you really want to test anything you're going to feed to the worms. And it's very easy to do. You just have a, a small container, you put that type of food into the container, you add a handful of worms and see how they respond to it because they will either start eating it or they will leave. Or if, you know, it was really high pneumonia, they might immediately die. But it's really important to test these things out. And then you have to keep in mind that whatever the worm eats affects what comes out the other end for the vermicompost, okay? And so all of these things you see on the page um, are going to have, you know, the worms will eat all of these things, but then they're, um, you know, worms that are consuming cardboard are going to have different vermicompost um, from those that are eating manure. And so, um, and then food waste. And so, it's just something to keep in mind because it will affect the quality of the castings. Okay, so I just wanted to talk about these things too. Um, they, they each have, I go into detail in the book, but particle size, very important because you only, you know, you have microorganisms that are so tiny, we can't see them with our, um, with just looking for them. <laughs> we have to look through a microscope. And then you have these tiny worms. And so the smaller the particle size, the faster it will be broken down and consumed by these small creatures. So that's something to keep in mind. I added hom homogeneity because um, anybody who's had a small worm bin has noticed that worms are what we would call picky eaters. <laughs> so so um, for example, if you have um, watermelon, you know, melons tend to be um, kind of the premier, you know, preferred food. So they would beeline for, for melons and um, avoid the onions, you know, but if you pre-compost it, then it's, then you have a homogeneous um, feedstock to feed to the worms. Okay, because you're feeding them compost. So instead of raw onions and raw melon, you have um, your, they don't have those choices. It's all blended together in compost. Um, persistent herbicides, I'm going to show you a couple of slides about that because it's a very important consideration to make. Um, the other thing is that the food could heat up. And remember, we said that we want the the worm bin to remain at a fairly low temperature. So say you've got the right conditions, you're like, hey, right in the middle here, I've got my worm bin in a 70 degree environment. And now I'm going to pile on some raw whatever, um, very thick. And 
the thing is, it can heat up. So you really want to have very, um, uh, so you want to make sure that um, the food is either pre-composted or in very thin layers so it will not heat up. You also want to think about pathogens, and I believe I have a slide on that, and then I also discuss pre-composting on a slide that we're coming to. Okay, so I'm going to move on to persistent herbicides. Okay, this is what any composter or vermicomposter should know about because there are a certain class of herbicides that don't break down like other herbicides, okay? They need sunlight and mostly sunlight will help activate them to help them break down. And so they can remain active in hay and grass clippings and piles of manure and piles of compost or vermicompost for years, okay? And so this is very alarming. And so we have to make sure that this doesn't happen, you know, that, that it doesn't make it into our compost or vermicompost. So um, the effect is that it can cause poor seed germination, death of young plants, twisted cupped or elongated leaves, misshapen fruit, and reduced yields. For some people, um, no plants will grow. Um, for some people, they're, wherever they have used compost that is contaminated with these types of herbicides that are persistent, um, it can be years that before you could use that um, soil again, that plot of land. So it's, it's very alarming, you know? <laughs> so you just wanna make sure and keeping in mind that um, Okay, so we listed um, like hay. So for example, um, if you're getting horse manure um, or cow manure, they could, those animals could have consumed hay that was sprayed with one of these persistent herbicides. And so it's on the hay. It goes inside the animal where there's no sunlight inside the animal, right? So it comes out the other end and gets put into a pile of manure. Well, the pile, the outer edges will be exposed to sunlight, but most of the pile will not have sunlight. So it's not, the herbicide is not breaking down there. And then the, the manure may be used to create compost. And, and you can see it's, so raw hay, grass clippings, manure, all of these things, could go into a compost pile. And if they have, um, they do have residues of persistent herbicides, then um, you can end up with, you know, you think the compost or vermicompost is just fine, but it could be active with that. So I'm just giving you that alert and encouraging you to read this um, publication that I've highlighted in green. So this is the title of a publication that was written by a couple of colleagues of mine. And so here is the link to the publication. And then the US Composting Council also has information about persistent herbicides. And so there's the USCC's link as well. Okay, so um, pre-composting. So what we mean by that is that you go through the thermophilic composting process, but you, and, and so the temperatures go up and then once the temperatures have stayed at that high temperature for, for a while and the, and the feedstock is getting consumed, then the temperature starts to drop. And at that point, we would call that pre-compost and we would remove it and begin feeding the worms. So the difference between pre-composting and composting is that with composting, it's really important to give time for the pile to cool down. We're talking months for the, pool, for the pile to cool down and mature. And so 
the, with the pre-composting, the compost is still active with, um, with plenty of nutrients and food for the earthworms. So, um, so a lot of people do pre-composting and certainly in the book, I encouraged it and talked about it quite a bit. Um, these are some of the advantages of pre-composting. It's gonna reduce the volume. So whatever feedstocks you have, you can reduce the volume by you know, half or up to a third of what you start out with, which is really important because if you have really huge volumes and you're just feeding thin layers to the worms, then it's an advantage to have less volume that's gone through pre-composting. The next is destroying pathogens. And if you'll remember, that was on my list of considerations. So this is requ required by the federal government and um, any states that have composting laws that, um, and, and this is really important to kill pathogens, okay? So um, that means reaching a temperature of at least 131 degrees Fahrenheit or 55 Celsius and um, the requirements are for depending on if you're doing um, static aerated piles which on the the photo on the left shows doing that um, and then or if you're doing windrows so it's it's a time temperature requirement but the important thing of destroying pathogens you may think oh you know, I'm only using food waste. There, there aren't any pathogens in food waste. Well, think again. <laughs> think about how we um, we find out that E. coli or Salmonella or some other pathogen has been detected in spinach, strawberries, all sorts of things, romaine lettuce, all sorts of things make the headlines. So, those foods have been contaminated with pathogens. Um, if you're using, um, you know, anything that sat in a pile outside, you could have bird, bird waste, you know, bird droppings. Um, if you're feeding, say, grass, it could have dog poo on it, you know. So these are all pathogens, and it's important to kill them by reaching high temperatures. And also seeds. Think about if you're collecting food, um, food waste and so you've got seeds from melons and tomatoes and all sorts of things. And then um, think about weed seeds that have blown and gotten into, you know, manures and um, other crop residuals. So by reaching 140 degrees Fahrenheit or 60 degrees Celsius, it can kill off the seeds. And then it can also reduce it, the heat in the feedstock. So anybody who's you know been around a, a steaming pile of manure, <laughs> um, for example, if you pre-compost it, then you've taken the heat out of it. And so it's less likely to heat up your worm bed. So different types of vermicomposting systems, um, pits, trenches, beds, bins, trays, windrows, wedges, and continuous flow, the um, worm bins. These are all different options you can take. And so there is no right or wrong. It depends on your situation, what you can afford, what works best for what you have, okay? So, and some people start with one system and then they might um, build their, their operation um, larger and, and go with a different type of system. So I'm gonna show you pictures of from a lot of choices you can make. And so um, some people do it outdoors and then some people do it indoors, either in a permanent building or a Quonset hut or some kind of polyethylene structure or pole barn. That's what I have, um, my worm my worms are in a pole barn that unfortunately have some open uh, sides. <laughs> so th that's why the temperature can't be controlled. But you can do it on soil or asphalt or concrete, depending on your situation and what works best for you. So the space needed, keep in mind, you'll need some place to, to put the feedstock that you're gonna feed the worms. And then um, worm bins, should be 
um, no wider than eight feet, okay? Um, and, and that's because you need to be able to check on your livestock. Your livestock are worms and you need to eyeball each of the, not, well, each part of your bin so you can make sure, or bed to make sure that um, the earthworms are thriving. And so if it's over eight feet wide, it's gonna be very difficult for you to be able to see what's going on in the middle of your worm bed. Um, you may need an area to chop or grind the food. And then if you are going to do pre-composting, then you would need an area for that as well. So these are the basics for vermicomposting, okay? This is the money slide. <laughs> so you wanna start with six inches of bedding. My next slide gives you options for bedding, but so start off with six inches um, or you know, 15.24 centimeters, all right? And then you're going, and, and this bedding needs to be moist. Remember I said 80% moisture. So whatever kind of bedding you're gonna use, it needs to soak in water for a certain amount of time and before you add the worms. So you want it to be moist, but not sopping wet. So then you're gonna add your Isenia fetida earthworms at a rate of one pound or two pounds if you wanted to do it, but you know, starting out with one pound is probably the best way per square foot of surface area. Okay, so we're not talking about cubic feet here. We're talking square feet of surface area, and that's because the worms come to the top to eat, and so that's all we're dealing with there. Okay, so then when you apply feedstock, you only put about an inch thick, okay? Make sure it's less than two inches thick. But, and again, because if it's too thick, then it's, um, it has the possibility of heating up and harming the worms or killing them. So only about an inch of feedstock. And then wait until the feedstock is eaten before adding more. So, and you may say, well, wait a minute. I read that so-and-so worm farm feeds so many pounds per day of feedstock. And the thing is they don't, okay? They might, they're either taking a weekly or a monthly rate and dividing it. People do not feed the worms daily because the worms are not machines and they're not going to listen to you even if you try to say hey i want you to eat all of this in 24 hours they're going to eat as much as they <laughs> they want for the circumstances that they're into and just like yesterday you might have really pigged out and today you're not so hungry well they are living beings too and so they're not robots they're not going to consume a certain amount every day so you wait until the feedstock is gone before you add more. If you just add more feedstock on top of what's already there, then the feedstock that they haven't eaten will probably go anaerobic and it'll mess up your whole system. So wait until it's gone. So if you do decide to feed your worms raw food scraps, then you should cover those food scraps, okay? So that you're not attracting different types of flies. So um, cover them either with shredded paper or cardboard or put cloth or plastic or tarp um, over the bed just to try to keep out flies. All right, so bedding choices. Um, so you've got stable compost. That's what I usually use. Okay, so it's compost that has gone through the heating cycle and it has cured, so it's stable. And so that's what I usually use. So I'll take um, compost and, and uh, apply six inches deep and make sure it's moist. Some people have, um, a lot of people use aged horse manure. Again, you wanna make sure it's greatly aged. So, you know, at least a few months so that 
it's not going to heat up. It's very important that bedding does not heat up. Bedding is the safe zone for the worms. So it gives them an organic environment to live in. And so if, if things are not suitable for them, say if you apply too much food or the food is not appropriate for them or the food is too hot, they can retreat into the bedding and survive. So the bedding is very important. So some people use aged leaf mold or shredded brown, you know, dead leaves. Some people use shredded paper, though, you know, shredded paper is fine for small worm bins, but if you're going to do a larger system, then, um, you know, paper gets mushy. So I wouldn't recommend it for a, a large system. And then some people use coconut core and, you know, again, it's, it's got a big footprint, carbon footprint. So I wouldn't recommend using it. That's not what I use. And um, since we mentioned, um, since we were mentioned, since I was talking about small and large scale, um, if you want to do a medium to large scale vermicomposting operation, then do that. Don't don't do a bunch of small scale things. Don't take a bunch of buckets or some small bin and just, you know, say, oh, I'm going to have 50 of these because that's more work for you. It's harder to manage the moisture. It's just a different environment. And so you'll notice that when you, you'll notice the difference between managing a small bin and a larger bin. And in the larger bin, it can be much more forgiving for the environmental um, situation. Okay, so watering the worm beds, again, 80% moisture, right? So when you're putting your bedding in there, it is 80% moisture, but then um, you will get some evaporation. So you need to keep an eye on it. And so if it looks and feels on the dry side, then you want to use light applications of water and do that frequently. And when I say frequent, what I mean is avoid heavy, infrequent watering. So don't let the worm bed go for a whole week and then go, oh my gosh, it's so dry. And then you flood it. <laughs> that is not the way to go. So depending on your environment, your climate, your humidity level in the area where you live um, will determine how often you need to add water to your warm bed. Okay. My, what I, the setup that I have, um, we rarely add any moisture to it. Um, other people, they, they might be applying moisture three times a day, but in the photo, you can see misting. And so that's what you would want to do is have some kind of misting system. And you never, ever pour water into the worm bed, even if you've seen it on YouTube. Okay, that is not the way to go. So, okay, so healthy worm bin traits is that um, the worm bed will smell earthy like the forest. So um, within, even if you use hog manure, which is super stinky, Within 24 to 48 hours, there are so many microorganisms, there's so much microbial activity taking place in the bin that the um, those stinky odors will dissipate. And so, you know, I give classes in my um, worm barn and people are right next to these big macro bins that are filled with, um, that have cow manure in them. And, uh, people don't realize there are worms and cow manure right next to them because it doesn't smell. Um, you should not see earthworms. If they're um, busy eating away, they should be, you know, maybe you'll see them on top consuming some of the feedstocks, but you shouldn't see them on the sides or lid of the bin because that could mean there's a problem. And I do have a troubleshooting guide in my um, worms can recycle your garbage publication that I talked about at the beginning of this webinar. So the bedding fluffy, but you're not fluffing it up. Um, it's just, you know, when you put it in there, 
um, that it's kind of fluffy. So you want it, the contents to be damp but not soggy. You should actually see glistening skin on your earthworms. If they look dry, then your bin's too dry. You will see other types of, I call them critters. Um, what, that, what I mean by that is arthropods. So you'll see other insects in the worm bin and they are just decomposers that are supposed to be there. So usually, so, and again, I talk about that in the book. I talk about different types. And then your vermicompost will accumulate on the bottom. So um, I wanna show you different types of systems. So if you're outdoors, say if you're in uh, California or um, somewhere where there's a mild climate. Now the picture on the top left, that was actually taken in Texas. And you can see the worm windrows, they, they are less than three feet high, okay? So again, you don't want a tall windrows. I showed, I compared that to composting, showing um, some windrows that are 10 or 12 feet high. And again, with the composting, you want it to heat up. So you want that mass that will help heat up. With, but with vermicomposting, it needs to remain a shallow system. Okay, this is at a prison, and so these were some outdoor insulated bins, and they were installing um, uh, some screen on the bottom to keep out moles, okay? Um, this is obviously outdoors in the shade, very simple materials. Um, they put white, um, they painted it white on top to reflect the sun so you're not absorbing heat into the worm beds. Um, this is inside a barn, and many, many people throughout the world will use concrete blocks to make worm beds, and that works out really well. So you can see the shallow worm beds there, and they were covering them up with pieces of wood. Um, this is when I was in Chile. There were different types of um, worm bins, and so this shows an example. You know, this is easy to make. This is also in Chile. You can see they just used some boards and then, um, you know, bent some sticks and then they had shade cloth and that was very successful. Um, this is also in Chile. It's gorgeous um, piece of uh, artwork that is um, a worm bed. And I'll talk about that some more later. This is um, in the Dominican Republic. Again, they were using the concrete blocks to make worm beds and um, in a very simple structure with um, materials that they gathered outdoors. This is also in the Dominican Republic, so um, a little bit fancier there, you know, but so they have, again, the concrete blocks, they have screens to keep out bigger critters, you know, like mammals, and, um, and then they have a roof to keep off the sun and rain. This is also in the Dominican Republic, so a different type of really nice looking um, worm bin that was in a botanical garden there. And then um, this is in, I believe, India, India or the Philippines. And this shows how you've got your shallow beds. And so the problem with shallow is that it's a horizontal process, you know? And so for this, they've turned it into, um, they've stacked them to become, to take advantage of the vertical space. The only problem is, you know, it looks like somebody has to shimmy up and down these, um, you know, the wood to be able to get a look at the worm beds. Okay, this is also, I think this is in the Philippines. And I was just showing, again, the concrete blocks, and then um, They've got a simple roof structure to keep off rain and sunlight. This was in the city of Middleton in Connecticut. And so they were um, picking up food waste from a variety of locations throughout the city and they had these stacking bins. So you can see it, it's like pallet racking and then they had um, wooden shallow worm beds so that they could take advantage of the vertical space in this greenhouse. And then this was um, papershavings.com, which doesn't exist anymore, but they were um, 
they were making paper shavings, I think for, for pet bedding or something. And so they had, you know, you can only recycle um, paper so long and the fibers get shorter each time. And so finally you can't utilize them to make more paper. And so anyway, they were feeding these short paper fibers to worms. So I just wanted to give an example of worm beds, the other worm beds you could have. Um, this was being used at several schools in Sonoma County, um, California. And so I profiled some of these schools in my book, and I just wanted to show you the pictures that they were taking, um, you know, those are the um, pipes that you would use for underground, and uh, they cut them, and then they made wooden lids, and then um, since raccoons could lift up the wooden lids, then they um, put these covers over the lids, but they were um, taking all of the cafeteria waste and feeding them to worms. Um, Echo City Farms, which works with ILSR, and so Benny Arez has designed these continuous flow worm beds that work really well. And so he has these in urban farm settings and in um, different uh, community settings and schools in the Maryland DC area. And then this is up in Ontario. These are insulated worm barns, bins. And you know, in Ontario, I mean, they probably have six feet of snow right now, right? <laughs> but they were doing vermicomposting outdoors. Um, speaking of snow, so whoops, speaking of snow, so this is in Colorado, so they made a worm bed that um, uses solar to help heat it up. Um, this is in somebody's basement, so these are worm um, farmers who sell worms and vermicompost at um, farmers markets and other locations, but they came up with these taking 55 gallon drums and turning them into worm beds. So that's a cool thing. And then this is, um, you can buy, purchase designs for this. Um, so these are called Oscar bed bins. This is in the basement of a restaurant in Boise, Idaho that I profiled. And so they have a continuous flow system in the basement of the restaurant. And these are trenches on a hog farm. And so um, the trenches are 21 inches deep, so the, the dark trenches that you see, that's where um, hog manure is applied to the worm bed, and then the lighter, um, what you see is, you know, light, that's where the um, uh, tractor can drive up and down and straddle the worm bed and apply the um, hog manure. So. Um, so flow through raised bed systems, a lot of people want them and use them. So lower left is, that's in my worm barn. It's a modular system that's eight feet by five feet. And so um, I'll show you what the uh, bottom of it looks like. So that's the actual worm bed there. It's two inches by four inches in this grate. And then what you're seeing here with a cable is where um, you can see at the end here, there's a motor and the other end has a motor too. And so when it's time to harvest the vermicompost, you, you activate the motor and it will pull the breaker bar across the bottom and about an inch of vermicompost will be shaved off and end up on the floor. So, um, so harvesting, like I said, the worms are in um, the top four inches of the worm bed. So you can get them out with a pitchfork and set it on, set the worms on a new bed and then use a shovel to remove vermicompost from the bed. So that's what I do with my, um, with the macro bins in my worm barn. The other is sideways separation. Remember I showed you the, um, you know, the worm bed in Chile. And so you can see he's lifting up the, um, the cover for one section of this worm bin. So you feed that, that section for a certain amount of time and as it fills up, then you start feeding the section next to it and the worms will mo move over into that section. So they kind of do self-harvesting. So you can see the worms just keep moving to the next section and then you'll just be harvesting 
the castings left behind from the section you're not feeding. So, um, and then trommel screens, a lot of people use those. So that's another option. Um, markets for vermicompost. So you could, if you want to get into selling it, you could sell it to home improvement centers and nurseries, landscapers like it, greenhouses, garden supply, grocery chains, flower shops, discount stores, golf courses, vineyards. Um, it's used on athletic and turf fields and, um, and also farmers will use vermicompost. So, um, it's important to get products tested. So um, there are certified labs. I talk about this in the book and I give you um, links to how to access these um, certified labs throughout the United States. Um, and so check out your state agriculture department. So it will be, you know, um, Department of Agriculture. So like for North Carolina, it's NCDA. Okay. If you're in Missouri, it's Missouri um, DA. But anyhow, they'll have, um, they'll talk about how to test compost and vermicompost. And then the U.S. Composting Council, they have a list of labs as well. And um, I encourage people, if, if you're selling compost, not vermicompost, that you get, uh, you become a member of their STA program, Seal of Testing Assurance. Um, you can't register vermicompost for that yet, but I wanted to make you aware of it. And then testing your product on plants can also, um, then you'll see, you know, if the plants are responding well. So, um, and then Brenda had mentioned that for the past 20 years, I've held an annual vermiculture conference. Here's the link to it. The, right now, the link contains information from my last conference that was held in um, November, but you'll be able to see the speakers and topics and get a feel for it. But I mean, it's, it's just a great way for people to come together and share information about vermicomposting on a mid to large scale. So there we, I'm wrapping it up just a little bit after three, but <laughs> there you go. Thank you, Rhonda. That was terrific. So we have a lot of questions that have come in. And uh, before we um, uh, get to the questions, we have a few uh, closing polls we want to do before people uh, hang up because I know not everybody can stay. Uh, to the very end. So we will um, take control back from you. And um, one thing I want to say is since you were just talking about um, your conference, which is amazing and terrific, is that we, uh, ILSR, is also holding uh, national cultivating community composting forums. And our next one is coming up in New York City, which is a hotbed of community composting, including some examples of worm composting on a community scale. So um, uh, if you're interested in attending that conference or getting learn more, here's the link uh, to learn more and let us know if you're interested by, um, you don't have to write down that, that uh, long Google form uh, link, but you can go on the website and get to it. So we hope that um, you're interested in joining us folks. And so uh, just do a few, You type in your questions in the um, GoToWebinar control panel, um, and we'll get to as many as we can in the next 20 minutes. But let's just do a few closing polls. Um, and we did add one on whether people have read your report, uh, uh, Rhonda. So um, first one here is... Now that you've heard this webinar, how I know a lot of you have already started vermicomposting, but learn more about <laughs> or reach out to others. So, um, and again, support vermicomposting means like funding, making it easier for policies, especially if you're with local government, and you can select one or more of, the, of these options. Okay, we have almost 70% of you voted. Some more votes coming in. All right, let's show the results. All right, so learn more, three quarters, support, more than half. Thank you. Okay, next question. As an introduction to medium and large scale vermicomposting options, 
Let us know if this webinar had just the right amount of information, too much, not enough. Well, clearly not too much information, Rhonda. So let's show the results. Most people thought it had the right amount, but people, looks like there's at least one third that want more, always more. Well, those people, then the next question, we just added at your prompt at the beginning, how many of you have read uh, Rhonda's book? I will just tell you that it is um, almost 250 pages and it's under $30. So, um, and it looks like, uh, only 4% have read it, 96% no. So for those of you who wanted more information, uh, order the book. And on the next slide, we'll just put up, oh, we have one more polling question, so not the next slide. We just like to hear how you heard about the webinar. So if you could just let us know which of these um, you heard about the webinar through, that would help us out. So the guest speaker outreach is through Rhonda, if you heard about it through her network. Okay, let's show the results. Okay, mostly through our email. That's what we usually find out. I'd be curious for the other to know more about that at some point. If any of you are inclined, let us know, because that was actually a higher percentage than normal. By the way, this webinar had more people signed up than any other webinar ILSR has ever hosted. So thank you. Um, so uh, the closing slide here that we have, while well, we're going to um, take questions, um, go one more, Virginia, to the last one. Um, just to, about the book, I put some of the links on the slide, Virginia and I, on how you can um, order the report. You can order it directly through the publisher, Chelsea Green Publishing, or we encourage you to do it through Indie Bound Books. Um, um, which is here, www.indiebound.org. And that will link you to your local independent bookstores. Of course, the book is available on big box stores and other big corporations. But since we have a anti-Amazon campaign here at ILSR, we really encourage you to support your local bookstore. So order through there or directly from the publisher. OK, so um, let's now move into questions. and. Um, one uh, question I'll just uh, answer. I think I did it through the chat window, but uh, somebody asked if we'll be getting copies of the PowerPoint slides. We post our webinars uh, with the recording and the slides on our website, so you'll be able to link to that, but we will not be sending out a PDF of the actual presentation. Um, and some of these, Rhonda, you may have addressed somewhat in your remarks already because they came in while you were talking, but um, I think it would be worth it just to talk a little bit more. So there's a question about, is it possible to vermicompost outdoors during the cold winter, such as in Massachusetts, and what composting setup would be the best strategy to keep the war worms warm and thriving outdoors during the winter? Okay, um, yes, you could do it. Um, Okay, so if I were going to process a large amount of feedstock or um, depend on my income being uh, vermicomposting, I would make sure that I had the conditions to make the worm bed itself be between 60 and 80 degrees. Okay, so yes, it can be done outside, but the worms are going to slow down the colder it gets. So it depends on what you can do to help keep those worms warm. And so I, you know, and for any of these things, I'd be happy to talk with you. Anybody who wants to email me, we can discuss this further, but, and it is in the book and I do have free resources on my website. So you might find the answers there too, but yes, it's possible to do that. And I noticed that somebody asked if um, this book, The Worm Farmer's Handbook, if it's different from vermiculture technology, and it's a lot different. <laughs> so vermiculture technology was a, uh, it's a 600 page book that I co-edited. So I'm, you know, listed as one of the co-editors on, um, on the front of the book. And 
This book costs over a hundred dollars and it's the first book on um, first scientific book on vermicomposting. So it's got a terrific amount of information from 13 different countries, 35 chapters. Um, so, but you know, it's reports by scientists and, you know, and others, but um, so it's scientifically um, how to do, you know, I don't know how to say it. It's, it, it's got a lot of great information, but the Warm Farmer's Handbook that I put together, I wanted this to be, it's in simple language that everybody could understand and whether you want to do it on a mid scale or a large scale and whether you want to make a profit or if you just want to handle um, some kind of organic waste. And I insisted to the publisher that it be a low price so that it's accessible to people because the 600 page book is very expensive. So, so they are different books. Good. Um, we have a number of questions about, along the lines of feedstocks and um, I'm going to ask them kind of together. Um, uh, there was one about can dog waste be composted with worms and another one about special considerations for vermi composting with biosolids. So why don't you take those two together because they might deal with pathogen issues. Yeah, okay, so with both of those types of feedstocks, they they do contain pathogens. And so um, you, you just have to be very careful in managing them. So um, the answer is yes, you know, you can vermicompost dog manure and um, human, human manure, but it just has to be on a very careful basis, you know, where you're, you're just making sure that you're not getting exposed to the pathogens and you certainly wouldn't want to sell it um, because it could still contain pathogens. Now there are studies that show that worms as they eat the feedstock containing pathogens that what comes out the other end has very low levels of pathogens. So that's really good news, but you know, again, you just have to be careful. Okay. Um, along the same lines are just feedstocks. Um, can large scale systems take meat and cooked food, especially if this is pre-composted? Oh yeah. If it's pre-composted, then, then, you know, it's, it's just looking like compost. So, so that's fine. Yes. You can definitely feed, feed any type of compost to the worms. Okay. What do you know about vermicomposting spent mushroom substrate? Uh, people are doing it. I, I know somebody here in North Carolina who's doing it. So, so that is, uh, that's another feedstock. I didn't mention that, but it can be vermicomposted. Okay. There's a couple of questions on, can the worms be invasive if they escape? Have you ever had any pushback from local environmentalists about red wigglers being invasive species? People do ask me about it. And um, so the good news is that Isenia fetida is not invasive. It will not harm the environment, okay? Now, they, they originated in Europe. They landed in North America when the first Europeans landed, okay? So they've been here for hundreds of years and they don't, they won't live through winter. So they're not going to, um, they're not going to, they don't cause problems. They're, they're very small and they're sensitive to temperatures. And so um, right before winter, they, um, they mate because they know they're not going to survive winter and they want their offspring to be able to, to survive. So in Wisconsin, Minnesota, um, in the mountains of Georgia and North Carolina, there are reports of invasive earthworms that are harming the forest floor. Um, and I sent a, every earthworm scientist who has studied this confirms that Isenia fetida is not one of those worms, okay? It's not harming the environment. So, and that's a big reason why I only focused on Isenia fetida in my book because I used to tell people that 
There are seven earthworm species that have been identified that are suitable for vermicomposting, but two or three on the list have been um, identified as being harmful to the environment. So I don't mention them anymore. I discourage, I tell people don't use them, but I send you a lot of fine. Okay, so a um, couple questions on asking about some methods to create a homogeneous feedstock on a large scale and um, realistic and economically viable methods to break down large pieces of food into manageable size for worms to feed on. Okay, so, so you just chop it up, okay? You can chop up food by hand or, you know, you with many different things, you know, I mean, you know, put it in a blender, put it in some type of blender or, or a um, mix, you know, a big industrial chopper mixer. Um, you can use a shovel to chop it up. So, you know, there are all kinds of ways because with composting, you need smaller particles too. So, so it's really important for composting and vermicomposting to have small pieces. And that's why you can get a, an automated chopper grinder or do it by hand. When I visit developing countries and teach there, um, a lot of people walk around with machetes. And so, you know, and they're very quick at just chopping things up very quickly with machetes. So, you know, there are many ways to develop small particle sizes. Okay. Um, there's a few questions on testing. So when doing lab testing of vermi cast, what specifically are you testing for? E. coli? Oh, no, no, that's an extra test. So um, with, with testing, you're testing the nutrient levels. So it will say, you know, what the NPK and other macro and some micronutrients are in the vermicompost. It'll also tell you the carbon to nitrogen ratio, which is very important. That it'll tell you the pH, the moisture level, different things like that. So that's where you can tell, you know, it, it can be very revealing what, um, you know, what's good about your vermicompost and what could be bad about it. And so I do have a special section in the book where I talk about that and I give what um, parameters you should be looking for. You know, what are the good parameters for a good vermicompost? But right. pathogens, for testing pathogens, that's um, uh, many labs won't do that, many state labs, or they might charge extra. They always charge extra for that, so. So here's, here's another question related to testing. Somebody who tests their vermicompost and they have good bacteria, protozoa, and nematode levels, but low fungal numbers. How do I get a more fungal vermicompost? Are there specific feedstocks I should use? Um, I, <laughs> I don't really deal with that. Um, okay. I, I feel like there's, there's a lot of emphasis on, on um, microorganism levels in compost and vermicompost. And um, I think, you know, people are sending in samples that you're getting a snapshot in time. So say you live on the East Coast and you're sending it to the West Coast and, you know, a week later or so they're analyzing it. In the meantime, you could be storing your vermicompost incorrectly and your whole population could have crashed. So, you know, um, yeah. Okay. There's a few questions on paper only vermi vermicast about does it diminish in value and somebody else who who's heard not to use shredded office paper due to possible dioxin or other poisonous bleaching. True. And they went go on to say, and I assume one adds thermophilic compost once it's pretty close to ambient temperature, question mark. Oh, I, okay. Um, Sorry, I'll, those are two different questions. Yeah, I was going to say I'll address the paper and then I wasn't yeah. sure what you were saying about the composting. But um, so paper, uh, things have changed. Just like inks used to be contain heavy metals and now they're made out of um, 
vegetables and, and legumes. And so inks generally are pretty safe and paper instead of um, having dioxins, they're using different ways to make the paper so that um, they're using, um, you know, like oxygen and other things to bleach it, unlike what they used to do. So, so yeah, you don't have to worry about paper um, being fed to earthworms. And um, as far as the quality, um, so Ohio State University, they no longer have a vermicomposting program, okay? But they used to study the effects of vermicompost on plants, and they had four different types of vermicompost. And so one type was produced from food waste, one was produced from dairy manure, one was produced from uh, hog manure, and the other was produced from cardboard. And so um, all of the vermicompost were very good and they had different effects on plants. So some plants preferred the paper vermicompost, um, especially because it the cardboard had glue, you know, glue in it, glue residues. So that was good nitrogen for the worms. So, but worms are used to remediate contaminated soils and so you know, that's why um, things that are contaminated, if you feed them to earthworms, then they generally what's coming out the other end is very low in that contaminant, whether it be heavy metals or pathogens. Okay, uh, we have a lot of questions that we're not gonna be able to get to. So uh, Rhonda, if you do short answers on these, we can get okay. to more. So what qualifies, quantifies as mid or large scale? That is amount of feedstock processed or vermicamp cast output, square footage of processing space? Oh, good question. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so, so there is no, uh, you know, formal definition of those things because there is no trade association for vermicomposting. So I just came up with it on my own. And so, you know, it's just small scale. If you're doing just your kitchen waste and and just using it, you know, at on site, then that's small scale. And then mid scale might be if you have a small farm or a community garden or that type of thing, then um, that's more of a mid scale. And then large scale would just be really super big, you know, where you're dealing with really huge um, volumes. Um, for example, I talk about in the book about in Mexico, a dentist in Mexico has over 70 vermicomposting operations or a combination of composting and vermicomposting and their smallest one is larger than pretty much anything we have in the United States. So, you know, there's no limit, but you can tell, you know, if it's a really large operation. Um, so I hope that answered it. Yep. How much time would you allow for eggs to hatch? Well, it depends on the environmental conditions. So the eggs will hatch when it's appropriate for them to hatch. Okay, it's usually, I mean, at a minimum, it would be three or four weeks after the, the eggs are created. But if the conditions are too cold or too dry or too hot, then the cocoon, the, the worms will stay in that cocoon for months. <laughs> They'll stay for a very long time if the, condition, if the environmental conditions are not correct for them. Great. Um, this might be just a yes or no answer. Do, can worms consume digestate from anaerobic digesters? I'd say no. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, can you, what about Central and South Florida? Too humid, not enough organic matter? Not, what kind of a question is that? Not enough <laughs> organic matter. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I mean, plenty, huh? The answer is yes, have, you can do uh, it. We have um, livestock, you know, I'm sure there's plenty of organic matter there. And it's humid, and humidity is important. So, for example, um, humidity does affect temperature. So, a worm farmer in Northern California once told me that 95 degrees Fahrenheit was the sweet spot for his earthworms. 
and my jaw dropped because at 95%, I'm sorry, 95 degrees here in North Carolina with our typical 95% humidity, it's killed my worms. So humidity is a huge factor. Yeah. All right. I'm going to squeeze in one last question okay. at the risk of going over time, but um, I thought this was an important one. So uh, somebody asked, how can I convince management to invest in starting a worm composting venture? And I'd like you to just expand on that, uh, Rhonda, to what is the biggest obstacle to really doing more of this kind of vermicomposting at farms, hospital, community gardens, schools, you know, all those places you mentioned. What do we, what do we need to do to, um, at all levels to, to be able to encourage more of this? Well, it's really important that people realize that it's a shallow horizontal process. So I do have municipal people call me and say, hey, I heard your webinar and I really want to I think our city is right for doing vermicomposting. And I often end up talking them out of it and I talk them into doing thermophilic composting instead. And I'm giving a, um, a half day workshop on Monday in Glendale, Arizona, this coming Monday. And so I'll be talking about how to, how composters, people who make thermophilic compost can boost their, their product by feeding it to worms. And so vermicomposting and also making vermicompost tea from it. So um, yeah, so I'd say it, it's just really important to understand what you're getting into and be able to, so there are some limitations on large volumes. Um, doesn't have to be, I mean, there used to be a very large scale operation in upstate New York where there, I used to kid them that they're covered with snow, um, three feet of snow, nine months of the year, you know, um, but they had a very successful vermicomposting operation. So, you know, it just, it's a matter of getting the right environmental conditions to keep the worms alive and help them to thrive. And it's important for people to understand that. Yeah, and I'll just add, um, you know, beyond kind of how you answered this, Rhonda, that I think, to expand vermicomposting at this kind of decentralized, distributed on-site scale, we need grants, we need training, we need the networking, you know, the conference that Rhonda's providing, we need exemptions from permitting, um, and we need local government to understand that this is a viable option uh, that could be in every school, you know, under the right circumstances. Um, and so we do need institutional support um, at state and local levels to, to move this and expand it. Um, but look at all the benefits that Rhonda has articulated. So I really, at this point, probably need to end the webinar. Thank you for all your excellent questions. Thank you for staying on to the end. Thank you, Rhonda. Thank you to my colleague, Virginia, for all her support. And uh, we will let everybody know when it's posted on our website with the recorded link. So. Thank you all for joining us. And that then concludes our webinar today. Have a good week, everybody. Thank you.